Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy, and this is your word at the middle of the week. This week, we are going to be summarizing a seven-part series we've had on here at the Word of the Middle of the Week about how to love your church and possibly die doing it. Uh, it's crossed over here a couple months, and so we've covered a lot of ground, and it's good to draw all that together into a simple summary and remember what it is we have talked about and how it is that we may love our church and possibly die doing it. That last part of the title is perhaps the more compelling part of it, possibly die doing it. Can we die from loving our church? And here we remember that we started this study by remembering the martyrs. Martyrs who died not only for confessing Christ, but whose confession of Christ brought them into love with the church and brought them into such a practice of love for the church that they were ultimately uh, killed, possibly crucified, killed in other ways for having um, so changed in how they live their lives. Here we're talking about especially the early church martyrs, how they lived their lives, um, that the rest of society deemed them a menace worthy of expunging from their midst. It was faith and love at work in them that did that, and hate, of course, in their persecutors, and evil at work in their persecutors, but it was faith and love at work in the martyrs, and part of that love was love for the church. So let's talk about what ground we have covered, and if I were to summarize everything that we've talked about with regard to love for the church, I would simply say it's summarized in Christ's call, which we find repeated throughout the Gospel of Luke, throughout the Gospels, but especially in the Gospel of Luke, take up your cross and follow me. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he spoke those words originally as a man who was on his way to do that very thing. The cross was not an idea from history. The cross was not part of a biblical narrative only for Jesus or for the people to whom he spoke. The cross was a daily reality of punishment in the Roman Empire, perhaps not daily, but it was a common mode of punishment in the Roman Empire. People knew what a cross was. They knew what it did to people. They could see it with their eyes because people would be publicly crucified before them. So when Jesus says, if you would be my follower, take up your cross and follow me, he is saying to people in that time, follow me, to be crucified, follow me to die. Because if you really want to know where I'm going, that's where I'm headed. I'm headed towards a crucifixion. I'm headed towards being utterly canceled by this world, crossed out by this world, laid into the grave by this world, and then in me a new world will emerge. So what happens now within the believer is that we also... Uh, have a daily crucifixion at work in us as we, through union with Christ, the fruit of our faith, um, learn to die to the world and to live to Christ. Part of dying to the world is loving the church. And loving the church, in a way, you could say, in the whole thing is a fruit of dying to the world. There is a crucifixion inherent to all of our love for the church and the ways of loving the church that we have discussed. To get us into that reflection and that summary, a reading from Luke chapter 12. Jesus said, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And also from Matthew chapter 12, we have this reading. <clears throat> Something else that Jesus said. 
While he was still speaking to the people, behold, the mother and brothers of Jesus stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In those two passages, we find the cross at work already in the spirit of Jesus as he is crucified to the world and crucified to his family of origin, as it were. Of course, his real origin is with God the Father before eternity. But in an earthly sense, his origin is the family of Mary, the wife of Joseph, and all the siblings that he had in through the marriage of, of Mary and Joseph. And he is saying that he has come. And, and not only is that his family of origin, but of course, everyone else in that world has a family of origin, that ancient world. And your family of origin was in many ways your destiny, and it was your protection, it was your insurance. He is saying, I have come to bring a new reality on earth in which families will be divided, will be divided by faith in Christ. And ultimately, we find in the New Testament, uh, the apostles teaching about the emergence of a new family. This is something we talked about at the very beginning of our study on loving the church and possibly dying doing it. We can look at the world, we can see there are three main realities to the world. One is family. That's a big reality and it's a much bigger reality than we think it is. Another is government, and which sometimes gets to be too big of a reality than it should be. And another is church, which we don't always think of as being on equal footing with things like family and government. Um, in the ancient world, family and government, everyone understood that these are two realities of life. In the Christian faith, a cross is brought into the world and laid on both of those realities. A cross is laid on family. A cross is laid on government. And that cross is simply this. There is now a higher authority, a deeper love at work, forming a new family, the church, forming a new nation, the church, and the government of that nation rests on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, who became despised and rejected by the nations and rejected by the government of his time and rejected even by the families of his time, even at times his own family seeking to restrain him. Why is this important? In the very beginning, we spoke about how we can tend to come to church with a mentality that is deeply embedded in our own families or households, in our own national identities or governments. And therefore, in in those two identities, church can be viewed as sort of a handmaid or servant to living out our life in family, living out our life in nation or in government. Uh, Not that we're all in government, but we're all part of a nation. And so we care a lot about the national life. We care a lot about our family life. We can look at church and say, how are you going to help me live out my life and family and nation? This is what I'm calling the consumerist mentality, where we look at church the way we might look at a department store or at a hospital or at a school and say, you are there to help me pursue my happiness in my nas- in my life as a neighbor and citizen and family member. But no, church has its own distinct reality and calls for its own distinct love. One that can crucify even our connections in our families and in our nations. That's important to help just from the beginning change our perspective on this and to start looking at the church as an object of love. Why? Because first we know that Christ looks at the church as an object of his love. If we are to follow him, take up our cross and follow him, then we look at what Jesus loves. Does Jesus love families? Yes. Does Jesus love nations? Yes. Uh, Jesus also loves the church. And we see this, we saw this in John chapter 13, in the last discourses of Jesus on the night in which he is betrayed, right before he's crucified, in that deepest, darkest hour, he gives a new commandment, namely that his disciples should love one another. When he says love one another, what he's saying is love the church. Because what is the church? That's something else we studied. The church is simply the gathering of believers 
around the gifts that Jesus gives. And this is the other reality to the church and to Christ and the great event that has now happened in Christ that we can never lose sight of, namely that our life in Christ is a matter of receiving his gifts. It is by the gifts and works of Christ that we are made righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? To be righteous is to, some might say, to live your best life now, but that's not quite right. To be righteous is to be all that you're ever intended to be. To be righteous is to be uh, perfectly holy, the person you are called to be. And that righteousness comes to us in Jesus, who alone is the perfect person, the perfect man, the perfect human being who became all he's called to be in the life of God. He's without sin. He gives himself for the sins of the world. He becomes the font of everlasting life, the mediator that is the connection between humankind and God. And so in the self-offering and self-gift of Christ, which he conveys to us through his word and sacraments, we are taught to trust in him, and by that faith, we are made righteous. We are, the scriptures say, justified by faith, set right. Um, by faith, why? Because Christ is right, and so his rightness, his righteousness becomes ours. So, in this new reality of the church, this new family, this new nation, we live by what we're given. We're, we live by the gifts that we're given. This is another crucifixion. Not only is a cross laid over families and nations, but a cross is laid over ourselves and over our own sense of righteousness. We die to old ways of trying to prove ourselves or trying to think best of ourselves. We die to an old way of looking at ourselves, and now we look at ourselves in the light of Christ, and we look at each other in the light of Christ. His self-offering becomes the light in which we understand who we are and who each other is. Christ loves the gathering of believers who gather around his gifts in order to receive that righteousness. We saw this in Acts chapter 2. So the church is simply the gathering of believers around word and sacrament, around the preaching of the gospel, holy baptism, holy communion, and all the gifts that Christ gives of forgiveness, life, and salvation through this ministry. That church is both a local church it is expressed in our local congregations, and it's also expressed uh, across the world in the universal church. So when we talk about what the church is, which we have to know if we're going to love it, we are talking about this new family, this new nation, which is formed not through our good efforts, not through our best intentions, but through the gift of Christ in his word and sacraments as we receive him and gather in order to receive him. That's what we're looking for when we're looking to love the church. So what are the qualities or the particular uh, dimensions of this love for the church? We looked at first a commitment to the truth. Because the church lives by Christ uh, and what he has done, there we must know who Christ is and what he has done. There must be a public confession of who Christ is and what he has done. And so to love the church is to be publicly committed to that confession of faith. And so we talked a little bit about why it matters or doesn't matter in order to be identified as a particular kind of Christian. Often we want to say, because it can be uncomfortable in our families and in our nation, for there to be divisions among Christians, and oh, it doesn't really matter, Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, nah, doesn't matter. When we talk that way, Sometimes we're talking more from our family and national identities than we are talking from a church identity. The value of being identified as a particular kind of Christian is that you are identified with a particular confession of who Christ is, which is part of loving the church. You want to love the man, the Lord, the God at the center of that church who's handing out his gifts and you want to share him with other people. That means saying, this is who I think he is. This is what I think he has done. And this is what I think he is doing today. That's simply confessing the faith. And different confessions of faith go by different names. Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Evangelical, Free, and all these other things. Sometimes people try to de-emphasize them because it's more comfortable to do so. But sometimes we need to recognize that the sharper they are, the clearer 
The truth is, and that's part of loving the church, allowing the church, just like you, when you love a child or a spouse, you want them to be who they are. To love the church, you must love the church as it is. So if it puts out on its little sign, Lutheran, in order to love that Lutheran church, you have to have some kind of relationship with what it means to be Lutheran and have some kind of connection to that. Uh, you may not always understand it. You may sometimes have disagreements with it. That happens within other relationships um, as we learn who people are. But nevertheless, there's a commitment to understand it, a commitment to confess it and to share in that truth. Then we also talked about presence. So just as there is a crucifixion laid over our whole view of the world so that we are now born again into this fellowship of the church, and there's a crucifixion over our sense of righteousness, and there's a crucifixion over our sense of um, unity, you might say, that you know we, we are committed to specific confessions of faith, so also does love for the church crucify our tendency to want to keep our time for ourselves and keep ourselves for ourselves. You cannot love someone and be absent from them. Neither can you love the church and be absent from the church. And so just as their a commitment to the truth is essential to loving the church, so is a commitment to be present to the church. And so we talked about a little uh, saying that is helpful. Being present at worship alone does not make you a good Christian, but part of being a good Christian is being present at worship. Just as having a good roof alone does not make a good house, because it can be bad for other reasons, nevertheless, a good house has a good roof. And so being present for worship, and not only for worship, but being present for the church's other activities, being present for the people in the church, having some care for your fellow congregational members in that local expression of the worldwide church uh, is essential to loving the church. We see this, both of these things I've talked about so far, commitment to the truth and being present at work in Christ. Christ does not shrink from the truth. Christ came, he says to his disciples, in order to preach. Yes, he healed. Yes, he helped people and fed people. But it was for preaching that he came. We see that when the disciples come and say, everyone's looking for you. You're doing so many miracles. And he says, let's move on and preach in other places. That's why I came. So he has a commitment to the truth. He loves us through that commitment to the truth. And also at the same time, Christ is present to us. I am with you always to the very end of the age, he says. And so we seek to keep in step with Christ. We follow Christ into that crucifixion of being present to the church. If we care about the truth of the church, if we care about being present to the church in both of these ways, mirroring Christ, then we also have to deal with the question of authority. What is the authority of the church? And ultimately, the authority of the church is a reflection of Christ's own authority as he exercises it in the ministry of salvation. How does Christ exercise his authority? By preaching and teaching. Ultimately, um, by humbling himself and becoming the servant of all, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. And uh, as he says, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. In the same way, the authority of the church at the heart of it is a teaching authority and a serving authority. And so uh, this is embodied in offices like office of pastor. There are other offices um, or other auxiliary functions within the church that uh, people take up, uh, ways of helping one another, ways of teaching one another, at the center of it, the word and sacraments, that becomes an authority in our life. In the same way that in a marriage, you know, my wife is like an authority on how Steve Jurdy behaves. <laughs> uh, I, Steve Jurdy cannot behave uh, now that I've made vows to my wife, I can't just behave any way I want to. Um, my wife has a claim on me. That's part of love. <clears throat> children, parents have a claim on children. Children have a claim on parents. Um, to be part of a nation is to acknowledge the authority of the nation, the authority of a family, so also in the church. And so we have to be upfront about what kind of authority that is and see that it is a teaching authority. It is a um, 
servant authority that seeks to bear all things for the sake of sharing the gospel. And then we want to love that authority and support that authority. This gets us to the question of generosity. Generosity has always been part of the way of the church. We learn in Acts chapter 2 that they held all things in common and forever, whomever had need, the church shared from its abundance with those who had need. Uh, they not only ate and drank at the Holy Supper, they ate and drank at a common table, um, meaning that term broadly. They didn't all just have one table, but I mean, their tables were held in common. They made sure each other had food. And so a cross is laid over our tendency to want to hang on to our possessions. And suddenly in the church, we look at our possessions and we see that just as our time and our presence and uh, our minds themselves are now committed to this body of the church, so are our possessions. And so we look at the church in the midst of its needs and we ask, how can I support this church? How can I love this church by giving generously to it? And that means we also have to have an eye for the needs of our fellow believers. We need to see what their needs actually are. That's informed by the word of God. Uh, we have to pay attention to the needs of our fellow believers. And certainly the church exists also to serve the larger world in its needs. But not only ever that. I mean, the church has established hospitals. The church has established schools. Excuse me. The church has established orphanages and done lots of good things. The church has become a counselor to the you know, governments of the nations. That's all good, helpful things that we can expect to happen because the church, like a good tree, is going to bear good fruit. But the ultimate primary service of the church is to preach the gospel, to forgive the sins of uh, those who repent, to call those who have not repented to repentance, and to say you know, good news. Salvation has come in this man, Jesus, who is God and Lord and who is raised from the dead. So that message informs our charity and our generosity. That is part of loving the church. So, so far, what do we have? We have that a new reality has broken into the world through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. That puts a cross on our families and our national identities, calls us also to love this body, the church, a new family and a new nation. The church is a gathering of believers around Christ's word and sacraments. because It's through those gifts that he creates faith by which we are made righteous and share in his righteousness. And in order to love that body, because Christ has first loved it and has first loved us and has called us to love this body, the church, uh, we are committed to its truth. We seek to be present to it. We seek to acknowledge its authority in our lives. We seek to be generous and to care for the needs of our fellow believers. Two other points that we covered is that we seek not to take revenge within the church, and we seek to remember the dead. And these may seem like sort of, um, sort of incidental to the other things we've talked about, but they're actually quite crucial. We talked about how it's very easy to sort of take revenge without realizing we're taking revenge. When we say something like, I think the example we used was, let's say a church was debating whether or not to buy a bus to haul around, you know, kids uh, to events or to buy a bus to go around and pick up homebound members and bring them to church. And there's a debate and some think they should buy it and some think they shouldn't, shouldn't buy it. They decide to buy it. You know, there's a little bit of an element of revenge, uh, a little bit in uh, saying, well, you know, if they're going to do that, then I'm going to be kind of a curmudgeon now. I'm going to make everyone's life miserable because I'm unhappy with that decision. Uh, if the basic tenets of the faith are not being denied, um, if the gospel is still being preached, uh, then we seek to look to other people's interests, or as Paul says in Philippians, to count others and their interests as better than ourselves and to operate in humility. That's the broader point in this point about not seeking revenge in the church, to operate in a humble fashion in the church in a self-controlled way. These are two gifts of the Holy Spirit in the book of Galatians, humility, self-control, gentleness, kindness. I love that list. I keep coming back to that list more and more. Uh, as I reflect on the faith and also remembering the dead. If the cross is laid over our sense of pride so that we're humble, if the cross is laid over 
our sense of ownership so that we're generous, over our sense of time and how we're going to be present to people so that we're present to the church, um, over our sense of independence so that we acknowledge an authority, uh, over our sense of, of truth so that we acknowledge this truth. If the cross is traced over all these things as we become part of a new family and a new nation, then we care about those who have been imprinted with the cross, especially, namely, the dead. We remember the dead of the church. We don't just love the living, but we also love the dead. And uh, we remember the dead. We remember what we call the saints in the life of the church. So that's a simple summary of how we go about loving the church. But all of it is summed up in Christ's words, take up your cross and follow me. Because in those words, he's calling us to be crucified with him. <coughs> Excuse me. And that crucifixion brought him with us, brings us with him, we should say. That crucifixion brings us with him into what Holy Scripture calls the new family of God, the new nation, uh, the Holy Church, which is like a little flowering now in this life of the world to come and of the joys of paradise. We experience it under the cross. We experience it under suffering and under the futility of our humanity in this life. So the church doesn't always look glorious. The, and sometimes when the church looks, looks glorious, you know, you, can, you have to be a little careful what's going on. Because the church, uh, properly speaking, looks crucified in the world. Looks as though she's being poured out in the world. It looks as though she's very humble and has lots of sin and isn't functioning right in the world. But that's because we are not yet in the fulfillment of the world to come when our Lord comes again. And so in this life, we live under the cross. We're united with Christ in his cross. And that union with Christ in his cross is especially fulfilled in our own individual deaths, as well as in uh, what will happen to the whole creation when Christ comes again and the new age is fulfilled among us. So, uh, how to love the church and possibly die doing it all involves a complete change in our thinking and in our perspective in which we cease looking at the church as a service that is here in order to help me live my life in family and nation. And instead, it is also an object. I shouldn't say also. It isn't even that. It's so much more than that. It's an object of my love. It is a body of which I am a member and it is part of the first fruits of the new creation now that Christ has risen. And this is what he's doing, gathering this nation across, this new nation across the world. So may God bless you as you seek to love the church. Um, suffering goes with loving the church. Uh, misunderstanding can go with loving the church. Uh, it can be tiring to love the church. There, there are a lot of crosses that go with loving the church, but it's also... Uh, blessed and exhilarating, and it bears much good fruit. And how would it not? Because this is the way of Christ, who loves the church himself, loves it very dearly indeed, uh, the apple of his eye, so much so that he permits the church to be called his body. Uh, there is no greater union than that. So next week we'll begin a new study. Um, Next week is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and then after that, we'll soon be in the throes of Advent. So Pastor Johnson and I will have a new study for you starting next week. This one concludes and summarizes how to love the church and possibly die doing it. May God's peace be with you.